and they performed every harsh deed, and blasphemous utterance, and sexual deeds on male and female, and among humans and on animals. Two hundred donkeys, two hundred asses, two hundred rams of the flock, two hundred goats, two hundred beasts of the field from every animal, from every bird, for sexual acts regardless of species. The outcome of the demonic corruption was violence, perversion, and a brood, of monstrous beings. They defiled themselves, they begot giants and monsters. The Book of Giants elaborates that when the fallen angels transgressed against Yahweh, they not only made it with humans, but also used their shape-shifting ability to interbreed with the animals of the land, the seas, and the air, resulting in the creatures of what we now call mythology, such as fairies, fawns, sphinx, werewolves, minotaurs, chimeras, flying horses, and even dinosaurs, which in themselves are not fed to us as being mythical, but still, these offspring would also go on to interbreed with each other and continue mating with humans. And they would continue this process for multiple generations, which created creatures that were a combination of different animals with humanoid-like features and also fallen angelic features, such as wings. Now, the fallen angels, there were different species of them. So you might have like your cat people, your reptilians, your Pleiadians, your Arcturians, your Arrhenians, your Sirians, and so on, who all have different features, which contributes to the way that these different mythical creatures came out looking. Again, the heavens is just another term for outer space. Angels are defined as heavenly beings. Aliens are defined as beings from the heavens. It is all the same. Our earliest ancestors called these different species of aliens deities and thus they were deemed gods and angels and for good reason as these different entities and all the earliest stories were actually responsible for creating mankind, guiding mankind, overseeing mankind, and helping mankind. They were known as the Anuna gods or the Anunnaki which is a broad term that represents a variety of the different species of entities that descended from outer space down to earth. In modern religious context, this is the gods descending down from the heavens onto earth. Notoriously throughout the entire Bible, Ham's lineage specifically is singled out and referred to as pagans and giants. In Genesis, we are told that giants are created by humans and fallen angels interbreeding. This means that even after the flood, Ham's line was having relations with these fallen angels. This is actually representative of Ham's line interbreeding exponentially with the Anunnaki. Why and for what have you left the high, holy, and eternal heaven, and had sex with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons? This is why I have given men wives, that they might impregnate them, and have children by them, that deeds might continue on the earth. But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. Therefore, I have not appointed wives for you. You are spiritual beings of heaven, and in heaven was your dwelling place. And now, the giants, who are produced from the spirits and flesh, shall be called evil spirits on earth, and shall live on the earth. Evil spirits have come out from their bodies because they are born from men and the holy watches. Their beginning is of primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called spirits of the evil ones. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth which are born on the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, war, destroy, and cause trouble on the earth. They take no food, but do not hunger or thirst. They cause offenses, but are not observed. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have proceeded from them in the days of the slaughter and destruction. And at the death of the giants, spirits will go out, and shall destroy without incurring judgment, coming from their bodies, their flesh shall be destroyed until the day of consummation, the great judgment in which the age shall be consummated, over the watchers and the godless, and shall be wholly consummated. The biblical demonization of Cam's lineage being referred to continuously as giant pagans shows that Cam's lineage interbred with the fallen angels exponentially. Meaning that while Shem and Yaphah lineages may have also done the same, it was likely infrequent in comparison to the lineages that stemmed from Cam. According to the curse God placed in the book of Enoch, the offspring of the fallen angels and humans will not have the chance to enter heaven upon death, but instead 
be cursed to become demons. These verses lay out the origin of demons and this means that Cam's lineage specifically is cursed to die and become demons as our first ancestors were subject to this curse. Cam is the son of Noah that is both depicted and documented as being as black as a raven. In these same texts, it is documented that his biblical name of Ham is incorrect and it was actually spelled with a K. That's the reason that Cam's son, Mitzriam, named his territory in Africa Kamet, meaning land of the black-skinned people. Kemet is present-day Egypt. When Kemet was renamed Egypt by the Greeks, that is when Egypt became mixed race. It was the first time that Egypt was ever conquered by a non-African group. This occurred in 350 BC, which is over 2,000 years after the flood and after Kemet's establishment. This is why people say that the ancient Egyptians were a very ambiguous mixed race people, because they were. But Kemet, which refers to the indigenous people of the land presently known as Egypt, was pitch black. And since the Semites frequently interbred with the Kemites, the people of Kemet ranged from shades of dark brown to pitch black because Shem was described and depicted as being black and handsome. Yaphov was described and depicted as pale skinned with black hair and brown eyes. When Yaphov's Greek lineage came into the picture, they lightened the look of the people. All of this is the reason that black people were told by racists that we have no soul and that we cannot get into heaven and that we are not even human. Both the demon and pagan factor of Cam's lineage is yet another reason why the biblical Yahweh would be angered every time that the Semites intermingled with the line of Cam, the Camites. On the other hand, this also means that our ancestors were half human and half gods. They were demigods. This is also why the saying that we cannot find mummies because the British royalty ate them rings true. In several indigenous cultures, they used to, and some still do, eat their gods or the person who is the personification and vessel for their god and gods, believing that it would give them a godlike nature. In Kemet, the pharaoh was believed to be gods who were chosen to lead the people and maintain order. British royals ate the Kemetic mummies because they knew that they were eating gods and ate them to absorb the abilities of a god. Same thing occurred during American slavery where white people ate black people made furniture and clothing out of our skin. This was just them following tradition that perhaps at that time in history, they knew or did not know stemmed from the Anunnaki or the fallen angels interbreeded with Cam's lineage, black people. As far as Ham's lineage always being referred to as pagans, pagan is just another word for a worshiper of another belief system. We are all pagans to somebody. Contrary to what most Bible readers believe though, the pagans mentioned in the Bible were not worshiping made up gods, they were worshiping the Anunnaki gods and Yahweh was actually the name of the leader of the Anunnaki gods. Pagans during biblical times did include the god of the Bible at the very top of their pantheon of gods. He was just not their only god and as you know this was a big no-no thou shalt have no other gods before me thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god this verse states that there are other gods in outer space inside the hollows of the earth and in the waters of the earth which aligns with what Sumerian texts say about the different domains of the Anunnaki and their roles in each of these domains. These Anunnaki gods above, below, and inside earth were the gods of these pagan religions during biblical times. And this aligns with the reason why in modern day, UFOs almost always become USOs, which are unidentified submerged objects that go into the water, and vice versa. These aliens are traveling from outer space and the skies into the depths of the oceans and from the ocean to the skies and outer space. This aligns with Sumerian and many African and many Asian indigenous originated ancient histories of mermaids and how the Anunnaki that visited them were reptilians that came down in space ships and went into the water but would come back out again 
and were able to shapeshift, but they were humanoid and reptile-like beings. The thing with the pagans was that if Yahweh did not provide a reciprocal relationship towards them and did not benefit them in any way, they would simply ignore him and proceed to worship the other Anunnaki deities that were more personable and reciprocal towards them. This is why the Babylonians were called whores of Babylon because they would just move on to another god if one god did not reciprocate their actions. And they obviously had moved on from the biblical Yahweh, which obviously infuriated him because of how important Babylon was to the world's population at that time. Babylon was the place from where all three lineages of Noah migrated into their allotted territories from. So for the leader of Babylon to be a pagan, this would biblically negatively influence the world's population after the flood. Thus the anger of God in the Bible towards Babylon. But these pagans, they did not have a problem worshiping and following a God's guidelines. Their entire culture was based around following these gods that they did worship and their guidelines. They had humongous rituals and festivals in honor of these gods. So it was not a problem for them to follow a God and make sacrifices. That was not it. They just knew from experience that Yahweh was a more selfish God who ruled with an iron fist who did not reciprocate the love his people gave to him and would instead expect them to still love, adore, worship him, and follow him without question despite the sacrifices they made while usually living pretty hard lives. They knew he was very short-tempered and would resort to disproportionate amounts of anger from the smallest infractions as he did in the Sumerian tablets. They knew that he felt that humans were too inferior to him to worry about the fickle matters of human lives such as rewarding them with a good life with enough to be able to survive and not only exist but to actually live life and be happy about it. They knew if they were to follow him him that they were to be expected to just be thankful that Yahweh still allowed them to breathe in the morning and did not just take their breaths in their sleep because in the Mesopotamian narratives he tried to kill all of his very own children because they simply tried to tell him that he was overworking them after he had ignored them for 3,600 years as they cultivated the earth. The Sumerians who later became known as Babylonians knew better than anybody as to who Yahweh was. They still held on to the knowledge of the world prior to the flood and they knew that Yahweh only saw humans as good for cultivating the earth, laboring and worshiping him. We were nothing more than animals to him which is why Adam in Sumerian means animal and why the Garden of Eden was called the Paradise of Eden prior to the Hellenistic era. And prior to the Hellenistic era, Paradise was defined as an enclosure for animals. Basically, the Garden of Eden was a slave plantation. These pagans knew that Yahweh did not even like for humans to have knowledge and free will, which is the ability to think for oneself, to learn for oneself, which is why it was such a huge sin for humans to gain knowledge. And this is where the whole Adam and Eve situation with the tree of knowledge occurs. And no, I'm not making this up. This is actually written in stone in the eldest tablets that contain the eldest creation and flood stories of mankind that were found in Sumeria, which is modern day Iraq. And I have explained the Garden of Eden situation in depth in my God is Satan video, as well as the stories that shape human culture video, which are almost a 40 minute watch combined. So these Babylonians and these pagans were demonized in the Bible because they viewed Yahweh as what we would call in modern day a textbook definition of a sociopathic narcissist. I do not understand how in modern day people do not understand why the pagans did what they did and moved the way that they moved. Today a constant topic is setting boundaries, recognizing narcissists, leaving toxic people behind, leaving behind people who only take and take from you and never reciprocate your energy. The pagans of the Bible did this with their gods and a religion constitutes how you walk, you talk, you dress, how you conduct yourself. It conducts everything. Why not carry the same energy when it comes to the religion that you are in and the God that you worship? Especially when you know that this is not some sky daddy, that this is a tangible being that is doing all of this. The biblical pagans knew for a fact that this was a tangible being and that is the difference between now and back then and this is the perspective that people miss and why they demonize these pagans in the way that they do. People fail to understand that these pagans were actual humans. There had to be some type of logic behind an entire population of people doing this thing. 
However, this probably explains why a lot of women who follow Abrahamic religion specifically attract narcissists and just simply deal with it because their God is a narcissist and their lineage for the past hundreds of years have simply just dealt with it. But that's for another video. Enki is the Anunnaki deity that is amongst the higher pantheon of Anunnaki entities. He is a reptilian humanoid. Enki is Horus, he's Osiris, Krishna, Jesus, he's Satan, he's Hades, Poseidon, and all their parallels when it comes to religion. He is depicted as a merman and was actually the Anunnaki entity who saved Noah and the entity that Noah worshipped. So, so you said that the Vatican worships Satan? So, so you said that the Vatican worships Satan? The Vatican worships Saturn. The Vatican worships Dagon, the fish god. The Vatican worships Saturn. The Vatican worships Dagon, the fish god. The Vatican worships Saturn. The Vatican worships Dagon, a fish god, and it goes back to, you know, you know, if you ever know anything about the Assyrians, Assyrians and the Sumerians, and you know, if you know anything about that, you know, Dagon was this fish god, and the Vatican them, you you gotta always look at things with a, knowing that they have a deeper meaning. Like I spend every day studying this stuff, you know, even from the robes that they wear, the black robes in the churches, you see those. You see, the, I forgot what they call but you see the priests and stuff wearing the black robes? Those robes represent Saturn. And this is recorded in all the eldest stories on this planet. Enki was the entity that created humans and was kind to humans. Of course, he was an alien and with that, he was a master geneticist, which is how he was able to create humans. Enki's name in the ancient Canaanite language is Yahu. And in ancient Hebrew, it translated to the tetragram Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh. Enlil is Enki's brother and Enlil has higher authority than Enki. Enlil is set in ancient Egypt. He is Jupiter, Thor, and a part of the Christian Trinity. Actually, Enki, Enlil, and their father Anu make up the Christian Trinity. Enlil is the entity that is typically the highest deity in any religion. Enlil is very short-tempered. He is black and white about everything and also consider humans only good for being laborers who were mindless and slaves. We were akin to animals to Enlil. Enlil is a weather and agriculture deity. As the Anunnaki leader on Earth, and only second in command to Anu, his father who ruled over the affairs of the outer space heavens, Enlil was called the Lord of the Air and the Prince of the Earth. Because of his authority, the Sumerians called Enlil, Satan, which is Sumerian for Great Administrator. The Sumerians' name for Enlil is the origin of the word Satan that we use today. So when Enki genetically modified humans to be able to reproduce and have free will and knowledge, he went against Enlil's way, and this spiraled into Enlil trying to wipe humans out via multiple floods and famines, and then eventually just an all-out world flood. And this is also where that scene that we are born into sin comes from, because we were never supposed to be born. We were supposed to be created by the Anunnaki fertility goddesses in a supply and demand fashion like a factory. Enki's decision to enlighten humans and give us the ability to birth our own children created a divide within the Anunnaki, and this schism is what created the notion of good angels and fallen angels. Those who sided with Enlil were considered good angels. Those who sided with Enki were considered fallen angels. So after the flood when Enlil found out Noah and his family were alive, he was completely pissed. But after Enlil noticed how pissed that Enki was, he decided not to go full throttle and instead compromises were made between all the Anunnaki and Noah's family. Meaning the fallen angels and the good angels made compromises. Nobody was damned to hell or anything like that. In compromising, Noah agreed to leave the knowledge of the culture and the truth of the happenings of mankind and the Anunnaki prior to the flood behind and instead manipulate the truth. And to make Enlil look good and seem pure, Noah agreed to refer to Enlil as Yahweh. This way, Noah's descendants, mankind, would willingly worship Enlil and regard him as a great and kind God, the only God. 
and this demonized Enki. And doing this meant that Enlil would not get the urge to completely annihilate the human race again. This was Noah's way of making sure that mankind survived throughout time. Because he knew that the reason that Enlil sent the world flood was because the human race had gained so much knowledge that they chose not to worship him. Instead, they chose to revere the nice Anunnaki, aka the fallen angels who walked amongst them. They chose not to revere Enlil because Enlil sat high and looked down. He would use other Anunnaki entities, specifically Enki, to send messages back and forth to the humans because he deemed us too inferior for him to personally come down off his mountain and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us. He almost killed all of his own children for trying to even communicate one-on-one -on -one with him. Imagine us, we were Enki's creations. The problem was Cam agreed to this to Enlil's face but never abided by it, so neither did his children. In the apocryphal book of Jubilees, Cam got upset at Noah for cursing Canaan and left to build the city of Yeruk of which he named after his wife, Neil Tamayak, and Yeruk today is in Iraq. The name of Iraq itself gets its name from Yeruk, and it is the world's eldest city. This is the first mention of any city being built after the flood, after all, so this does make sense. It aligns both with scripture and with history. Yeruk became a part of Samaria when Cam's grandson Nimrod became the first king of all three lines of Noah. He also made Cam's line royalty. This means Nimrod was the king of the world's population at this point. When the Bible says that Nimrod took them to Shinar, it means Sumeria. Shinar is biblical Sumeria, which we know today as the cradle of civilization after the flood and the first advanced civilization after the flood that contributed most to the way that we live and learn today. Nimrod, a black man from Cam's Kushite lineage, was responsible for developing Sumeria. Sumeria means the land of the black-headed people. They were proud of their black skin. It equated to royalty because Cam's lineage was the ruling class, and thus they named their lands after the tone of their skin. Nobody ever asked what would enrage an entire population to want to build such an immaculate structure that the Apocrypha states was three times the height of the Burj Khalifa, which is the highest building in modern times. Nimrod was not stupid and going after some fictional creature in the sky, he had became king because he was not only strong and a giant, but very intelligent. And for his people to back him and be so angry that they worked day in and day out to help him achieve this goal says a lot. They could not all have been crazy and irrational. They did not think of God as some sky daddy. They knew that he was a physical being and they knew how to reach him because their ancestors were in constant contact with these heavenly beings. Cam, Shem, and Yaphab likely did not have the same mother. In religion, Cam is the demon Shamden, who also goes by the name Hamadai or Kamadai and Ashmodai, as well as Ashima. And Cam, when referenced to as a demon, is referred to as being the king of devils. In the Bible, Shamden is referred to as Ashima in 2 Kings 17 and 30, and is rendered to being the dead god of the Syrian Hamathites, who they made an idol of. As you probably can tell from the name, the Hamathites are the descendants of Ham, the Hamites. In some texts, Cam's mother is actually Nama. Many have heard of Lilith, but Nama and Lilith were best friends. Nama was the first woman to seduce the Anunnaki fallen angels. Nama is sometimes listed as Noah's wife, and many believe that this Nama refers to Noah's half-sister, but they do not pick up on the context that say otherwise. Of course, the writers of biblical texts want Noah to seem pure, but he was human after all. And all of the biblical patriarchs were actually screwed up when you look at their actions objectively. Noah was not the exception to this. In some texts, Noah even left other wives and other children behind when boarding the ark. According to the Midrash of Bereshit Rabbah 36 and 3, Shamden is the demon that helps Noah in the vineyard, but threatened Noah that he would hurt Noah if Noah dared to short him his share of the vineyard. In the Bible, Noah was drunk off the wine made from his vineyard when his son Cam saw him naked and told his brothers about their father's drunken state, mocking Noah instead of tending to his father himself. Shem and Yaphab then proceed to cover their father by walking backwards instead of joining in with mocking their father with their brother Cam. Noah wakes up and the Bible says Noah knew what his son had done to him. This is preceded by what seems like a disproportionate curse on Cam's youngest 
his son, Canaan, whose descendants are cursed to enslavement. So we get a scope of Cam's character in the book of Jasher where it states that Cam stole the skins of Adam from his father Noah before exiting the ark. These skins are the skins that God gave to Adam and Eve to clothe them before exiling them from the Garden of Eden. These skins were said to be anointed and give one the power of greatness and kingship and anoint one with priesthood. Noah intended to pass these skins down to his firstborn and favorite and chosen son, Shem. These garments were deemed angelic clothing, which we on this channel call alien or Anunnaki clothing. Other texts say that when Enoch was taken up to the heavens, the archangel Michael disrobed Enoch of his earthly clothes and robed him with these heavenly garments. In some rabbinic interpretations, based on the original word used for naked, it is determined that when the Bible said that Cam saw his father naked, the word naked means to be without the garments of Adam and rather refers to Cam stealing these skins of Adam from Noah which then left him naked and that Cam showed all the garment to Shem. In turn, Shem and Yapha took a similar garment and placed it over Noah. But the next day when Noah came to his senses, he knew that the garments that he was wearing was not the anointed skins of Adam. While in other interpretations of the same story, not only did Cam take advantage of Noah's drunken slumber and steal the skins of Adam from him while Noah was drunk, but Cam or Canaan actually sodomized Noah, castrated Noah, and then had an affair with Noah's wife. But Noah's wife was not Cam's mother, but rather a stepmother. This may sound bizarre, but this was actually the custom in ancient times when it came to dethroning the clan head. And Noah was the clan head. In fact, in Sumerian narratives prior to the flood, Noah was the actual king of Sumeria. And you have to remember that this is occurring after the flood. So everybody on earth that is in existence at this point is a descendant of Noah. So of course he is the clan head. In the seventh chapter of the book of Jasher, we find that Cam passed these garments down to his eldest son, Cush. And Cush passed these garments down to his son, Nimrod. These garments were seen to give its wearer kingship and mighty power, which is why the Bible states, Nimrod became a great hunter which was the most respected title a man could have in ancient days. It's akin to a modern day person being named as the wealthiest or the most powerful or influential person in the world. These skins were obviously something special as these skins represented authority. Now deities, heroes, kings, giants, and demons in ancient times were documented as wearing an ambiguous substance called melam, M-E-L-A-M, which covered them in terrifying splendor. The effect that seeing a deity's melum has on a human is described as ni, a word that means physical creeping of the flesh. Both Sumerian and Akkadian languages contain many words to express the sensation of ni, including the word palutu, meaning fear. So seeing a deity's melum that they were wearing cause humans to feel instant fear. This word melum provides the basis to the word melanin, which people of more rich and darker skin tones possess more of than anybody else on this planet. It just flows through our entire bodies and is actually worth more than gold. This explains the fear those with less melanin feel when they see dark skinned black people. This melum, this melanin. Nimrod was wearing these garments which contained melum and this melum was what activated his melanin to a whole other level, giving him a godlike status and ability. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic poem from ancient Mesopotamia and is regarded as the earliest surviving notable literature and the second oldest religious text after the pyramid texts. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the prominent source of influence in the books that make up the Arabian Nights. This piece is what inspired Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which in turn influenced Greek culture and mythology by large and are what most people today recall ancient Greek culture by. And this story is the basis from where the Bible constructed the story of Eve being created from Adam's rib. In this epic, we find that Nimrod is Gilgamesh. The skins of Adam in Greek mythology are called the Golden Fleece. A dragon has the head of a goat. The reptilian Anunnaki is where the origin of dragons come from. This is seen with Enki's sea goat form that is the origin of the Capricorn constellation. If you combine a goat's head with that of a serpent's body, a dragon or mermaid is formed. When Enki created Adam, Adam was partially created from the flesh and blood of the Anunnaki water entity that led Enlil's children, who were enslaved, to rebel against him. 
The golden fleece in Greek mythology is a ram's hide. This murmurs the skins of Adam being the skin or the hide of the Anunnaki entity that was sacrificed to create Adam. This fleece in Greek legend equated to the practice of alchemy. Alchemy is the precursor to chemistry. The word chemistry actually comes from alchemy, and alchemy is a science based on the transformation of matter. The word alchemy comes from the comedic name Keme, which means black earth. Remember, the original name of ancient Egypt was Kemet, which was coined after Cam's name. And Kemet meant land of the black skinned people, and Cam was coined as being as black as a raven. Alchemy mainly focuses on converting base metals into noble metals. A base metal is a common and inexpensive metal such as iron, nickel, lead, copper, and zinc. A noble metal is what is considered a precious metal that has metallic elements that shows outstanding resistance to chemical attacks in high temperatures and are well known for their properties associated with stimulating chemical reactions. Gold, silver, platinum. These are noble metals. Another major focus of alchemy was to find an elixir of immortality, which Gilgamesh's quest in the Epic of Gilgamesh was. Alchemy is one of the three main components of occult sciences along with astrology and natural magic. Before all this terminology and science, things weren't what we call them now. These three components of occult sciences was just simply viewed as sorcery. But sorcery is a precursor to a lot of sciences. So this golden fleece is linked to ancient knowledge, alien knowledge, knowledge from the heavens, and Anaki wisdom. In the Greek legend of Jason and the Argonauts, a dragon is protecting the golden fleece. In Mesopotamian texts, Cam is actually an Anunnaki entity named Apzu. The name Apzu actually means bird and it was a divine storm bird that was half man half bird and considered a demon. In Sumerian and Akkadian mythology, the Apzu stole the Tablet of Destinies from Enlil and hid it on a mountaintop. To translate this into something that could be understood in modern day, the Tablet of Destinies is another name for the Book of Life, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, the Collective Conscious the Akashic Records, and the likes. This is Cam stealing the Book of Life from Yahweh. I am sure you have seen this image before whenever discussion videos of the Anunnaki occur. This is actually a depiction of Ninurta killing the Apsu. Ninurta is the Sumerian name for Gilgamesh, meaning that Ninurta is also Nimrod. This picture is a depiction of Nimrod killing his grandfather Cam. Ninurta is actually the son of Enlil, meaning that Ninurta is the son of God, meaning Nimrod is the son of God. And by God, I am referring to Enlil because Enlil took Enki's name of Yahweh. Ninurta was conceived from Enlil raping Ki. Ki in other cultures is Hathor and Isis in ancient Egypt. She is Ishtar to the ancient Babylonians from where we get the holiday Easter from Ishtar and she serves as the Statue of Liberty. She is the mother of the Freemason Order of the Eastern Star. She is Venus to the ancient Romans, Aphrodite to the ancient Greeks, the original deity representing the star on the Islamic flag, and the goddess Nuwa to the ancient Chinese. She is the hair fertility goddess that helped Enki create humans. She birthed Adam and she is also the mother of the earth as she helped Enlil create the plants and the animals of the earth. Ki is mother earth. Ki was actually the wife of Enki but Enlil would shapeshift and do other mischievous things to trick Ki into having sex with him. He even raped her. Ninurta was conceived from his father raping his mother. So you can only imagine his resentment for Enlil and this also goes to explain what occurred biblically when Nimrod built the Tower of Babel to go to war with God aka Enlil. He had a love and hate relationship with Enlil because of his origins. The resentment behind it all. Enlil in ancient Greece is Zeus and Zeus was notorious for raping women by possessing the bodies of their male lovers and having sex with the women thus resulted in little demigod babies. This is theoretically what occurred with Cush the father of Nimrod. This explains how Cush and Enlil are both the fathers of Nimrod. The story goes that when Cam stole the Book of Life, it was hard to defeat Cam because the Book of Life has the power to reverse time. It even becomes a hard task for the mighty hunter and king of kings, Nimrod. According to the myth of the Apsu, Yahweh gave Cam the position of being the guardian of his sanctuary, but Cam turned around and betrayed Yahweh and stole the Book of Life. This is not hard to believe considering that prior to leaving the Ark, 
In the book of Jasher, Cam stole the skins of Adam. The book of life was a sacred clay tablet belonging to Yahweh that granted him his authority. So Cam was essentially on a rampage of stealing what would be considered very powerful weapons of mass destruction. Sort of like those Marvel comics where they have to collect all these different talismans to put together and destroy the world or something. By stealing the book of life from Yahweh, it caused all the Anunnaki gods to be stripped of their powers. After Cam steals the book of life from Yahweh, Yahweh sends three gods to defeat Cam, but it does not work. So finally, Satan, aka Anki, proposes that Yahweh send Nimrod. So here we are, we have Cam with the book of life versus Nimrod, who at this time is the possessor of the skins of Adam. Nimrod, the mighty hunter, confronts his grandfather Cam and begins to shoot him with arrows. But given that the book of life can reverse time, Cam uses his powers to cause Nimrod's arrows to fall apart in mid-air and revert to their original components. The shafts begin turning back into the giant grasses that they were made from. The feathers of the arrow turned into live birds and the arrowheads returned to the stones that they were carved from. Even Nimrod's bow returns to the forest and the wool bow spring turns into a live sheep. Nimrod calls upon the south wind for aid which rips Cam's wings right off. This was possible because there were different Anuna gods who were assigned to certain gates in the skies or the heavens that were controllers of the weather on earth. This is what they call in religion the heavenly gates. So this is what Nimrod called on to aid him in defeating Cam. Nimrod then slits Cam's throat and takes the book of life and Nimrod's victory is announced. As a reward, Nimrod is granted a prominent seat on the council of the Anunnaki gods and Yahweh sends the messenger Godbird to request Nimrod to return the book of life. But Nimrod, who resents Yahweh, his father, he turns around and he initially refuses to return the book of life. But by the end of the story, Nimrod does eventually return the book of life to Yahweh. In ancient Greece, they called Nimrod the deity Pan, which is why this story may sound familiar to the Greek story of Pan helping Zeus get back his sinews from the deity Typhon. Sinews are tough fibrous tissue that unite bones to bones, tendons to tendons, and ligaments to ligaments. Pan is the Greek god of the wild, the shepherds, flocks, rustic music, spontaneity, and the companion of the nymphs. He has the hindquarters, the legs, and the horns of a goat in the same manner that a fawn or a satyr does. He is a horned god, just like Enlil and Enki, which is why Pan, just like Nimrod, is often believed to be Satan himself or the Antichrist. In fact, Pan is where we get the story of Peter Pan from. The Pied Piper was a rat catcher who was called upon by the citizens of Hamlin to clear away a plague of rats, which he did with the aid of a magic flute, which hypnotized the rats and he promptly led them out of the town and into a river, where they drowned. However, when the citizens refused to pay the Pied Piper, he angrily left but vowed to return. On St. John and Paul's day, when most of Hamlin's adults were in church, the piper returned and used his magic flute to hypnotize all of the town's children and took them away just as he had done the rats. The children were never seen again. The tale of the Pied Piper was also inspired by the Greek deity Pan. Nimrod is the second most documented character in Mesopotamian texts outside of Ishtar. Ishtar, in some lore, is Nimrod's wife who in these stories take on the name Semiramis, who was actually first the wife of Nimrod's father, Cush. But just like Cam, or Canaan, did Noah, Nimrod dethroned Cush, and instead of just castrating Cush, he actually killed Cush and took his own father's wife, who was his mother, the queen mother, Semiramis. And Semiramis is Ishtar, and Ishtar is Ki, and Ki is Isis, and Isis is Mother Earth. The list goes on as I explained earlier. Semiramis is the mother of Temus. Temus is the cherubim angel that we celebrate on Valentine's Day. That little cute guy shooting the bow and arrow, that is Temus. Except that if you ever actually seen a biblically accurate drawn angel, they look nothing like that little baby. And of course, the real life Temus who was likely classified as a cherubim angel just based off his parents' lineage, did not look anything like that child that shoots that bow and arrow with the little hearts and all the cute stuff. Gilgamesh is also mentioned in the Book of Giants as the giants go to Gilgamesh for help against Enlil because they have a dream of Enlil sending the world flood. Enki was likely to be the culprit behind sending these giants this dream in the same way that he sent Noah a dream that forewarned about the flood. 
So you see, Ham's lineage in and of itself is a huge question mark. And everywhere that you look in regards to this lineage, it is adorned with traces of having oversaturated roots of demons and the Anunnaki and the fallen angels. There is a reason that the Old Testament was written only by Shem's lineage and was based on them and why the New Testament was written by the Gentiles of Yahweh's lineage and why Cam's lineage has no part in the modern Bible that they constructed specifically for their line like the Semites and the Yaphites were able to do. There is a reason Nimrod was ready to go to war with Enlil himself and built the Tower of Babel to do so. Just really think about it and sit on it for a second and think about the physical build of black people. You can see that we are the descendants of all of those lines that descend from cam that are spoken of in the bible as being pagans that are giants because they kept interbreeding with the fallen angels even after the flood this is evident in our physical build to this day and why our physical build is considered the most athletic build out of all the races on this planet <laughs> Think of how the indigenous belief systems of Cam's lineage are demonized and called dark magic and black magic. Sorcery is the ability to manipulate matter and energy. This was the forbidden knowledge taught to mankind prior to the flood by the Anunnaki's fallen angels. This is the knowledge that Cam's lineage and the indigenous of the world that were influenced by Cam's lineage refused to leave behind during biblical times and flourished because of so. The different ethnic groups spawned from Cam now know not their familial links to each other, and thanks to colonization, every group looks down upon those in the group and amongst them, with darker skin tones. That same darker skin, that has more melanin, and was once revered for its superhuman abilities, and associated with royalty and divinity. The darker the flesh, the deeper the roots. This should be honored, but instead, the world has done a complete 180 just like in most facets, humans have actually devolved. I do believe that fear is coded into our junk DNA. Junk DNA is 98.5% of our DNA. Junk DNA is basically defined as non-coding DNA that does not provide instructions for making proteins. Basically, this is the part of the DNA that scientists are unable to understand and they do not know why it is there, what it does, they know what it doesn't do and that it does not make protein, but outside of that they have no basic idea of what it is and what it is there for and this part of our dna makes up 98.5 percent of our dna meaning scientists in the 21st century basically only understand 1.5 percent of our dna as stated before cam's lineage is the pitch black race this race was the first conquerors as Nimrod enslaved all three lineages of Noah but raised his lineage, the Kemetic lineage, the Kamedic lineage as being the most superior and royalty and placed lords and kingships under him from the line of Cam. I do believe that outside of the demigod and the demon factor of black people's lineage of the Kamedic lineage, white people have an innate fear of black people passed down through generations of genetics that come from the beginning of human civilization when black people, these Kamedic people, these Kemites were their slave masters and whatever our people did to them probably has nothing on what they have done to us in modern day. We were the first colonizers, the first slave masters. It does not help that Cam's line was much larger and much stronger and had Anunnaki abilities and powers to really crack down on their servants and their slaves and instill such a deep fear that even thousands of years later, their ancestors still feel this fear. And somewhere along the way, they found out the solution to all this was to just erase us of our roots. Nimrod is perhaps the most important piece of the puzzle from the Bible in relation to today's world, but he gets glossed over. The key to understanding history is understanding the first civilization, the first ruler, but Nimrod just gets a few verses in the Bible. But again, the Bible was edited with an agenda from the elitist cults throughout the centuries. They do know the truth. And honestly, considering the possibilities just based off the Mesopotamian texts on Gilgamesh, on Nimrod in general, just based off that and the possibilities of what the Kemetic lineage, the line of Cam did to the Yaphetic and the Semitic lineages, it kind of makes sense why there would be an agenda to slowly but surely erase the history of the Kemetic 
culture. To sum up this video, the origin of the reason that racists believe that black people have no soul and are not able to get into heaven and that we are not even human, this stems from the curse God placed that is mentioned in the book of giants when God states that the children that are products of the fallen angels and humans interbreeding will not have the chance to enter heaven but instead be damned to remain on earth and roam the earth and become demons instead upon death. This curse was never lifted even after the flood so with Cam's lineage predominantly being the main perpetrators of interbreeding with the fallen angels continuously throughout biblical history. This in theory means that our earliest black ancestors died and became demons. This is potentially another reason God's wrath was shown when the Semites continuously all throughout the Bible kept interbreeding with Cam's lineage because now their fate too is on the line. However, being the descendants of the fallen angels who interbred with humans does make our people have human and it also makes our people have God or demigods. But it does also make us demons by religious standards. This is written. For more discussions of conspiracy theories or odd and unusual things that happen on this planet or in outer space or anywhere, please like, comment, and subscribe. I will not let you down. Also, what are some conspiracy theories you would like for me to talk about? Because I've heard a lot, but obviously I haven't heard them all. Please comment down below and let me know.